Timothy again tonight. So go ahead and grab a Bible, 1 Timothy. We're going to be in chapter 3. So please uh, turn there with me. And once you're there, say, dude, I'm so there. Okay, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, and we're going to be reading verses 14 through 16. And just before we, we come to this again, I just want to remind you that this is, this is God's word. This is God's word. It's not, it's not just merely man's word. It's God's word. And so as you're coming uh, to this word tonight, we really want you to be encouraged to hear this as God's word for you tonight. There's something in this text that God wants to speak to your heart tonight. This is not originally written to you, but it's written for you. And so God wants to speak to you. And so right now, in, in just the quiet of your heart, I want to just encourage you to say, Lord, speak to me. Lord, help me to see what's in here. Help me to hear from you tonight. There's probably things, distractions that are on your mind and on your heart. There's, there are probably things that you're going to be tempted to wander off mentally and totally get off track of where we're going. And I want to just encourage you to bring yourself back. Every moment that that happens, bring yourself back and fight to hear from God tonight. You probably won't hear all that God has to say to you tonight, but fight to hear from him through his word as we read it. Let's, re let's read uh, 1 Timothy 3. 14 to 16. Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you now to unpack your word, we recognize that you want to do a work in our hearts of transforming us from one degree of glory to the next. But we also recognize that that transformation is difficult. There are things that we are loving in our hearts, things that we're treasuring in our hearts that we ought not to treasure. There are sins that are entangling us and frustrations and angers that we have in our hearts. Lord, there are things in our hearts that we are reticent to release to you. And so, God, we confess that tonight. We confess that we want you to do a work in our hearts. We desire you. And, Jesus, we just we want to be reminded that everything about you is, is beautiful everything about your nature, everything about your goodness, everything about your faithfulness, everything about your glory is beautiful and radiant and we lack the ability to see it. And so Holy Spirit, we pray right now that you would give us the ability to perceive the things that are not seen. God, you are spirit. And so you speak to our spirits. And so we ask, Lord, that you would speak, that you would illuminate our minds, give us a supernatural attention to your word. We pray these things in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. So the connection that I want you to think about tonight and ponder tonight is that gospel-centered discipleship is collective conformity to Christ's character caused by confession. So there are a lot of C's that I'm super excited about in this main point. Gospel-centered discipleship is the collective conformity to Christ's character caused by confession. Collectively, 
We ought to be conformed into the image of Christ's character, and that only happens as we confess Christ together. God means for us to conform into the image of Christ, not only as individual believers, but as a collective group together. We're meant to transform into little Christ together. And you can't be more like Christ without the person sitting next to you also spurring you on to be more like Christ. You're to be conformed into his image. You're to be changed. God does not mean to leave you as a junior higher and a high schooler forever. He means to grow you up into Christ. And in your tendency, my tendency, is to look at Christ's bride with criticism. But have you ever noticed whose bride it is that you're criticizing? If you have a low view of the local church, if you have frustrated relationships with the people in this youth ministry or the people in this church, do you realize that you have frustrations with Christ's bride? So let me just give you an example. If you have frustrations with my wife, Lauren, you also have frustrations with me. Is that fair? If you... I'm not saying anybody's doing this, but if you are in a back corner talking about my wife and I overhear you, how am I going to feel about that conversation? Not positively. Because she is my wife. She is me. You're talking about me. You're talking about my family. And the way that Christ relates to his church is in just that same way. <clears throat> and so... If you have a high view of Christ, then you will inevitably have a high view of the local church or the people around you. Now, by the look on some of your faces, and obviously I can't judge what's in your heart, your intention, you look at someone else and you don't see all that's there. You don't see the fact that the person sitting next to you bears the image of God. You're paying attention maybe so much to your internal world that you're not looking at the other person and seeing, oh my goodness, they too were made in the image of God. They too are bearing his image. They too have something to teach me about God's glory and about God's grace. You don't relate to each other like that instantaneously. You need to be changed to do that. And Christian maturity comes as we have this stewardship of God that comes by faith. As you put that into practice in your life, as you put the gospel into practice in your life, you're conformed into Christ's image. Collectively, we're changed as a group to the glory of God. That's what God means to do through this text. So in other words, the gospel is meant to be driven down into the very practical ways that we behave, that we act, that we think, that we feel. Now, I remember uh, in my own personal story, um, I grew up in an, a middle-class, church-going family. When I was young, I, I just viewed the church as this weird place where people just like got together and, and sang songs together. And I grew up in a sort of a charismatic church where people were practicing tongues and doing all kinds of like weird experiential stuff that I felt like made me uncomfortable because being like a little kid, you're just uncomfortable with everything because everything is brand new, including charismatic experiences. In junior high and high school, I was a part of a Presbyterian church uh, that was somewhat reformed and a very, very small Christian school, and Christianity was sort of wedded to whether or not I was getting good grades. So the pressure to be a good Christian child was the exact same pressure as getting good grades. And I was just taught internally to, to be good, or at least to be good enough to pass the next test. And then finally, in, in uh, the later stages of high school, my family just stopped going to church altogether. They're just tired of, 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 of their frustrations with the local church. And my dad led just kind of a, a campaign of criticizing the local church. And slowly, his faith began to be deconstructed as he began to think about maybe the possibility of other religions of being true. And slowly but surely, my dad left our family. It was a significant moment of loss in my life. And I'm putting that before you, not to make you feel sorry for me, but to say that you are on a trajectory in your life. 
You're walking a path right now. And that path is eventually going to lead to various crisis points. Moments where you're challenged, do you actually believe this? Not does the group around you believe this, not do your parents believe this, but do you actually believe that Jesus is who he says he is? And in these moments, you're going to be thrown back onto the bedrock of what you actually believe. And the inclination today is to deconstruct whatever it is that you were taught when you were young. Whatever it is you were taught growing up ought to be deconstructed or taken apart and replaced with something that is actually true and verifiable. Uh, Brett McCracken, who is a, a writer for the Gospel Coalition, says this, if you're considering a break from Christianity, make sure you've given real Christianity a try. This Christianity doesn't fit neatly within your politics and preferences, but constantly presses you on different fronts. Refusing to be boxed in or manipulated into what you want it to be, this Christianity doesn't simply affirm you as you are, but relentlessly pushes you to become more like Jesus. The prevailing mantra of our culture is you do you. You be who you are in yourself. You find out for yourself who you're supposed to be and you just go ahead and do that. And Jesus says in the parable of Good Samaritan, go and do likewise. Paul says, be imitators of God as beloved children, Ephesians 5, 1. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Or Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. John 1 is this beautiful picture of what it's like to actually be a child of God. Listen to John 1, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, that is Jesus, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So sometimes parents come to me and they're very concerned about you. Is my child going to persevere in the faith? Trent, what are you going to do to make sure that my child stays happy with the local church? And I want to answer that question this way. Parent, I will do my absolute best to trust Christ, to model Christ, to proclaim Christ, to glorify and exalt Christ, to preach Christ, to live Christ, to consider death as gain in my life, to show the surpassing worth of knowing Christ above all other things. But parent, I cannot keep your child. I cannot keep your child in the local church. That's God's business at the end of the day. And so when you graduate... When you walk out of these doors, what I want more than anything, my goal in life is to present you mature in Christ. So that when you walk out, you see God with such a high view that you look at the local church and you're like, yeah, problems are everywhere and I'm part of that problem. That um, among this group, I am the chief of sinners and Christ Jesus came to save sinners. What does that mean? God himself came to save people like me and people like us in this building were flawed. The church is broken. That doesn't mean that we break down and deconstruct our faith. It means that we recover a high view of the gospel. Now, just to give a, a parable of what this might look like, right now, I don't know the status of your room, but if your parents have any jurisdiction over you, any oversight over you, their job in some ways is to tell you, go clean your room. And you don't do that with this like excited, well, if you're anything like me, you don't do this with like, do this with, like an excited thumbs up, like, yes, finally, they gave me a command that I'd love to obey. But you do it. Eventually, your parents are not going to be there to tell you, go clean your room. And you're going to have the ability to self-govern over your room. And if you're a guy in here and you're, you're linked up with two other college guys in a dorm room, that's three guys with no mom. Which is a recipe for a disaster of a room. And maybe you've seen a college dorm room before. They're like hazmat suit worthy. In the same way, when you graduate 
from Thirst Youth Ministry, when you graduate out of your home, you are going to be responsible for caring for your own soul. You are going to be responsible for putting yourself under pastoral leadership of making sure that your soul is cared for, making sure that you're reading your Bible, you're coming to Jesus with your sins and confessing them one to another. And so when you graduate, I want to challenge you. You're not going to graduate maybe anytime soon, but I want to challenge you by saying, do that now. Present yourself to Christ now. Hear the gospel now. Put yourself in discipleship relationships now. Confess your sin now. Begin that practice so that when you graduate and you're no longer pressured to do it by the people in your life, that you will still respond to the gospel. So gospel-centered discipleship is a collective conformity to Christ's character caused by confession. How does this happen? How does, how does that, a, a high school student graduate and stay in the local church? Well, it's by having a high view of Christ. And in having a high view of Christ, having a high view of the local church. Let's look back at verse 14. Paul says, I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. And if you're anything like me in junior high, you'd be like, buttress of the truth. What in the world does that mean? We'll get to that. Don't worry. Paul says, look, I'm going to come to you, but I might not come to you. What if your parent left one evening and said, like, I'm going to come home, but I might not come home later. Would you do the dishes? Would you feed the cat or the dog? Would you take out the trash? And Jesus uh, talks about this in Matthew 24, 44 to, to 45. He says, therefore, you also must be ready. The coming of Christ is coming. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. I'm not sure exactly when I'm coming back soon. You must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you don't expect. And then he asks this, this prevailing question, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? And Jesus says at the end of Revelation, surely I'm coming soon. So in other words, Paul is in some ways acting just like Christ here. He's like, Timothy, I'm going to come to you, but I'm not sure if I'm going to come to you when I think I'm going to come to you. I hope to come, but God's sovereign. I don't know what my life is going to hold between now and then. I could be dead, Timothy, but I want to come to you. In verse 5, he tells him why. He says, I, I, I want to come to you, but if, even if I can't, I want to say these things to you so that you may know, in verse 5, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. And, and this is kind. I remember in, on my 10th anniversary, Lauren and I went to this very, very nice restaurant in downtown Boise, and we felt completely out of place. I basically wear this all the time, and this is a nice restaurant. It's my 10th anniversary. I want to treat my wife to something nice, and so we go to this very, very nice restaurant. We sit down in like slick chairs. Immediately we walk in the door, we're like, we feel uncomfortable. We do not belong in upper class society immediately. They're asking us questions about like Perrier and and wine choices, and we were like, I don't know. And, and the worst of it was there was, a, there was like a faux pas. That's, that's French for like a mess up, right? So this, this server comes out, and he, he gives me this, this lime, and it falls into the drink. And it's like, oh, shoot. <laughs> what do I do in this kind of environment? So I, being kind of like a middle-class guy, I just decide I'm gonna just going to kind of kind of grab that lime and then squeeze it in and just call it good. The server comes back and he's like, oh, you took, the, you took the lime like out of the water? I was like, yeah, okay. I was like, what did I do wrong? I don't, I don't know, I, I did something wrong. And then there were like multiple forks. My wife and I tried to like keep forks to save them because that's what we would do at our house. We don't want to wash like five forks, but that's part of a five course meal, five different forks. So they take the forks, right? Super awkward. And we're the only ones sitting in this room ourselves with like one other couple oh, it's so uncomfortable verse 5 you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God which is the church of the living God a pillar and buttress of the truth here's what Paul implies just like me in, in, in a five-star restaurant I don't know how to behave and that creates all kinds of awkwardness and discomfort and problems in the same way 
We need to know how we're to act and behave in the household of God. And that's not because God is pretentious and will get mad at you because you took out the lime from the water. It's because you're walking in to the church of the living God. He's alive. You know that. When you come to church, you're meeting with a God who's alive. When you go to prayer, you're coming to meet with God who is alive. And I know that just seems like obvious. But later in life, when you graduate and you're tempted by all kinds of things in life, the first thing that you're going to begin to think is, is God even real? And this text says to you, yes, he's alive. He exists. He's really there. And so everything we're doing right now actually matters to God because he's alive. One day, I will be called to account for how I handled this text, how I spoke to you about these things, how I cared for you as a pastor. God is alive. The second thing I want you to see out of this is that the church is a pillar and buttress of the truth. What this means is, is the church itself is a radiant, beautiful pillar of the truth. And maybe you don't, you don't come to church feeling that way, like there's the pillar. <laughs> and there it is. The, the foundation of truth is right there. And I'm going to, right? No. And that's not even what Paul is saying. Our church isn't, I love our church. I love our building. It's not necessarily the most beautiful building you've ever seen. It's not the Sistine Chapel. There's no Michelangelo's here. But that's not what Paul is talking about. He's not saying, look at how beautiful the, the church is. Look at those pillars. Any man or any woman could be impressed by great pillars. But the church of the living God, who's going to be impressed by that? A simple gathering on a Wednesday night, a simple gathering on a Sunday morning, who's going to be impressed by the church but the living God himself? You remember, God is spirit. And so his community, his church, is a spiritual community. We're located in a place, a building, which is good, but we're not defined by the buildings or hallways or pillars that are in our church. We're defined by how we represent the glory of God and the truth of God. Do you, do you see the church that way? Do you see the community of faith? Do you see each other that way if you've trusted Christ? There stands a pillar and a member of, of the pillar of the, of the foundation of truth. So filled with truth is this person that they give me a ground to stand on. So our second point coming in verse 16 is that gospel-centered discipleship is this collective conformity together, this collective conformity to be a pillar and buttress of the truth, uh, but it's conformity to Christ's character. So look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. And before we get to the actual contents of this mystery, I want to just unpack what Paul is saying here. He's saying, without argument, this mystery of godliness is great. When you read this, do you recognize that? Would you be able to add yourself to the we confess? Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Is it amazing to you that the church of God has existed for 2,000 years, that it still stands today, that we still have his word, that we're still hearing it? Does that amaze you? If you have trusted in Christ, you see things differently than others. Just, just this afternoon, as I was getting ready for this message, there was a helicopter in the sky that was super loud. It was like rattling my house. And so naturally, as any Boise citizen would do, I went ahead and went outside to look and see if I could see this gigantic helicopter that was wreaking havoc on my preparation. And so I go outside, and it's a cloudy day, and I look up, and I can hear the sound, but I cannot see the helicopter. And that is exactly what it's like for a person who does not see with the eyes of faith 
to, to hear these words that I'm saying right now, but not be able to see the glory of what's in these verses. If you've seen Jesus, if you know Jesus, you can recognize that great indeed is the, is the mystery of godliness. So, so what is Paul talking about here? What, what are the contents? Let me just say one more thing about mystery. I think I have this verse behind me. Um, maybe not. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And you might think of a mystery like a mystery novel, like something that is, is, is sort of unresolved. That's how we think about mysteries. But I want you to think about mystery uh, like this, from this quote from a guy named Jonathan King, who's a, a theologian. He says, as the glory of God's actions, now watch this, as the glory of God's actions in Christ during his earthly ministry career was glory revealed, not glory concealed, it was the optics, or in other words, the way of seeing given through faith alone that determined whether or not someone rightly perceived him. Does that make sense to you? If you see your life, if you see your experiences, if you see the word of God through the eyes of faith, God is willing to open up to you mysteries of himself that other people cannot see. If you place your, tr your trust in Christ, you're able to see something about Jesus that other people can't see. You're able to see things about Jesus that you couldn't see a few years ago. I remember in junior high and high school just trying to keep my eyes open when reading my Bible in the morning, struggling to be like, I don't see anything here. And now I can hardly shut my eyes as I'm reading my Bible because of all the things that I do see. And that's not to just tout how much I can see by faith. It's just God has done a work in my life to reveal the glory of God in the face of who Jesus is. So as this mystery is revealed, what, is, what, is, what are the contents of this mystery? And that leads us to our last point where we'll close up. Before, before I kind of read this, though, I want you to hear from a guy named Augustine. I want you to just hear his name, for one. But I, but I want you to ask yourself the question, do you see Jesus like this? When you hear the name Jesus, when you read of Jesus in your Bible, do you see something like this? He says this in his commentary in Psalm 44. He says, let us therefore, who believe? Notice that, who believe? If you believe, let us therefore, he says, run to meet a bridegroom, that being Jesus, who is beautiful wherever he is. Beautiful as God, as the word who is with God. He is beautiful in the virgin's womb, where he did not lose his Godhead, but assumed our humanity. Beautiful he is as a baby, as the word unable to speak, because he was still without speech. The heavens spoke for him, a star guided the magi, and he, had, he was adored in the manger as, as food for the humble. He was beautiful in heaven then, and beautiful on earth, beautiful in the womb, and beautiful in his parents' arms. He was beautiful in his miracles, but just as beautiful under his scourges. Beautiful as he was invited, as he invited us to life, but beautiful too in not shrinking from death. Beautiful in laying down his life, and beautiful in taking it up, taking it up again. Beautiful on the cross, Beautiful in the tomb and beautiful in heaven. <laughs> Jesus is meant to be seen as beautiful. And this is where we come to our, our final piece. Jesus, this, this mystery of God that's revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ, he's manifested in the flesh. And if that doesn't just like blow your mind, then you've never heard of anything called the hypostatic union, which is also a giant way of saying Jesus is God and he took on human flesh. Let your brain meditate on that for a while. He's vindicated by the spirit, meaning he's raised from the dead. Think about that for a little while if you don't see anything in that. Seen by angels. Angels, spirits exist. And oftentimes in the Gospels, they're the main persons who see Jesus for who he is. And they're terrified and trembling. 
proclaimed among the nations. There's never been anything like the gospel in terms of its advancement throughout the nations. Believed on in the world. And finally, Jesus was taken up in glory in his ascension. And so we close simply by asking, do you believe this? Because if gospel-centered discipleship is conformity to the character of Christ by confession, then if you do not believe this, you ought to question whether or not you are a Christian. If you do not see the glory in this, the, the beauty of Jesus and who he is in this, then you have to ask the question, do I really have faith? Because if you do have faith, if you do believe, if you have trusted Jesus, then you see something in Jesus in this text. You see something beautiful and radiant about who he is, and you're willing to stake your entire life and all of eternity on whether or not this is true. And that changes the way we live day to day. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you again. And we recognize, Lord, that this mystery is, is great. As Paul says, who is sufficient for these things? And Lord, we recognize that we often come to this text not recognizing the fact that you laid down your life that we might have life that you were raised for our justification, that you're sat down on the throne on high so that you make intercession for us constantly as our high priest. And you've given us of your Holy Spirit so that we can see these things. Lord, forgive us for the ways that we've not believed in the truth of these words. And help us now as we apply them in small groups, God, to rest in you and to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you guys are dismissed into your small groups. If you don't know where you're going, please feel free to come and talk to me. Otherwise, we'll see you on Sunday.